go back over some things. The first thing that they've given you was a threefold answer to the question. Can we prove that there were structural changes as a result of the fall? And that first answer and proof came in chapter 3. Of course, Genesis, not Exodus or Leviticus. Verses 1, 14, 16, and 18. In looking at the serpent, and you can put in parentheses after that uh, the whole animal kingdom from verse 14, the woman in the ground. Now, in all three of these cases, we see, uh, I hesitate to say by implication, that always gives someone a back door to say, well, you're grasping at a straw. Uh, we really see it very plainly, chapter 3, verses 1, 14, and 16, that in the serpent, in the woman, and in the ground, we've got very obvious structural changes taking place as a result of the fall. Now, we're not going to go back and look at those verses. We saw them last time. Now, the second reason or second proof of the yes answer to our question of structural changes <coughs> comes from chapter 1 and verse uh, 30, uh, along with uh, Romans 5 and verse 12, wherefore as by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin. And so death passed upon all why? For all have sinned. Now back in Genesis 1 and verse 30, if in the very beginning they had the appetite of a herbivorous creature, then why in the world do we have these fangs and these great claws and just the great strength in itself? Think about that. Why do we need to have the terrible strength in the forearm of a grizzly bear when all he's going to do is eat grass like a cow. I mean, if you know anything about grizzly bears, they can take your head off with one swipe very easily. Why the need of all this? He's not going to be slapping mosquitoes that light on him. You don't have little pests of problems like that. Now, we're stuck with those today. Isaiah 11 says we'll be out of them one day, but uh, I'll never forget when we first moved up here, I guess it was over the, the Simon's house, we were over there one day, and they had one of those, uh, what do you call it, a mosquito trap, looked like a bear trap, because they said that's how big the mosquitoes were up here. So we're blessed, uh, if that's the word to use, um, with large ones here in this state. Obviously, with is this much water, you're going to have to end up with big mosquitoes. Prehistoric, in other words. <laughs> Type mosquitoes. Well, you see, this uh, dissipates any need for carnivorous, not appetite, but characteristics, if they all they ate was herbs and vegetables and fruit and things they plucked off of trees and uh, maybe some small roots that they could have dug out of the ground. Now, remember Romans 5, 12, no death prior to this time. Uh, I can show you from chapter 3 and verse 21 that it was as a direct result of the fall, we've been contending this now for this whole class, that there was no death of soulish conscious life prior to the fall. If you look in Genesis 3 and verse 21, we've got a very clear hint that there was indeed no soulish type death until after the fall. Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. Well, where did he get these coats? I mean, there weren't any trading posts where you could swap all for some grizzly fur or something. He had to kill the animals himself. There you've got death. Now, there's no death prior to this, remember. And it's not until after the fall or after Genesis 3 that we have the introduction and the initiation of some of these carnivorous characteristics in the animals. Why? Because the appetites of certain select ones changed as a result of the fall. Now, why some changed and others didn't, there's really no way of answering except that was in God's own plan. He chose to change the appetite of some to 
uh, relish meat and to keep others in the herbivorous category in which they had been since Genesis 1. I mean, obviously, we still got animals today that don't eat any type of flesh at all. So they would be in uh, at least a similar sense of what was prior to the fall when they ate nothing but herbs and uh, vegetables and fruits and berries and nuts and leaves and grass and twigs and roots and all types of vegetable matter. Plant kingdom, in other words, they could have taken. But here in Genesis 3.21, we've got our first notice of death. You see, the serpent doesn't die automatically. Uh, Adam and Eve don't die physically automatically. What's the first thing to die? Well, you've got two animals, one animal, five animals. I don't know how many. However many it took to get clothes of skins. You see, he had tried, Adam and Eve had tried to put a works religion together, sewing together aprons. Uh, one Bible has breeches or breeches from fig leaves, but it just doesn't cover up. I mean, that just won't go through the rainstorm. So what they needed was something to not only keep them covered, by the way, God from the very beginning wanted man to be covered, and we live in a society where all you do is uncover everything. Fig leaves, I guess you can guess, would not cover as properly and as modestly as the skins of animals would. But not only that, of course, we see blood sacrifice here. Uh, for Adam and for Eve, for the forgiveness, the transgression of their sins and that forgiveness. And then thirdly, the protective colors of the females and young keep them from predators, as we mentioned earlier. I'll just throw in a verse, we'll look at it later on this evening, chapter 6, uh, verses 11 through 13. Okay, that deals with some of the physiological changes as a result of the fall. What about the flood in the physiological area? Well, let me give you a couple of things. <coughs> we'll say more uh, at a later time, maybe next week. First of all, there would have been a supernatural suspension of the ferociousness of certain animals. Now, now we're, we're gone past the fall of the flood now. We're looking at changes that the flood would have brought about because that's really where we are. We're studying about the flood. This is seen in chapter 6 and verse 19. Now, obviously, this didn't come about after the flood. This came about in the preparatory stages of the flood because if carnivorous appetites and therefore characteristics uh, had been placed in certain animals, then you're going to end up with a grizzly bear and a Tyrannosaurus rex and all types of other dinosaurs and other types of creatures, just take the serpent, for instance, that you wouldn't want to be around. Now, how is he going to be able to get all of these animals corralled into that silly little cracker box that he's going to be floating around out there on the sea with? He's got a lot of animals to put in there. Some of them are very ferocious. This is what we see here, and we'll look at these verses, chapter 6, verses 11 to 13 later. But he's got to deal with these animals. So one thing that the flood brings about is temporary, by the way, but nonetheless it's real, and it's a supernatural suspension of the ferociousness of certain animals. Now, he wouldn't have to suspend the ferociousness of uh, a possum, because a possum is not very ferocious. But those animals into which these carnivorous appetites would have come and as a result carnivorous characteristics would have been implanted, uh, then these would be the ones that would have been had the uh, ferociousness of their character and demeanor suspended. Verse 19, of every living thing of all flesh, two of every sort, shalt thou bring into the ark to keep them alive with thee, they shall be male and female. Now, obviously, the only thing we can end up with here is the fact that those that were ferocious after the fall had that ferociousness temporarily suspended at this time in order for Noah to be able to get them onto the ark. And then, secondly, some other things would have taken place. 
we would have had the impartation of estivation, hibernation, and migration. Now, some people believe that uh, these characteristics, such as migration, were probably already in the animals. That's a possibility that they could have been latent within the animals, but it's rather dubious because if the tendency, see, you wouldn't migrate because there's no cold, there's no hot, everything is just suitable for you, so there's no need to migrate. There's no cold winters, there's no need to hibernate. There's no hot summers, there's no need to estivate. So none of these things would have been needed. Now, if these three characteristics would have been latent within the animals, uh, it's a little bit ridiculous because only two, or depending upon the type of animal, seven of these animals were, these things were aroused in them so that they could come to the ark, such as migration, for example. Now, the rest of the animals, let's just take, uh, let's just take the grizzly bear for a moment. And let's say that you've got a male and a female, and we're talking about migration. Now, there's no need in assuming that that would have been latent migration. The ability, potent ability of migration was latent in all grizzly bears because all of them were going to be destroyed except two. They weren't going to migrate anywhere except two of them. So probably what happened was that this time, just prior to the flood, these things were placed in the animals. That's why the flood is what brings about this result in them. And therefore, they, the two animals, the male and the female, would have migrated. Now, I'm not saying they had to come from Siberia down to Mesopotamia. They lived somewhere in that area. But maybe they had to come five miles or 50 miles. We don't know how far. But how did they get to the ark? I mean, this is a question. We've answered it before, but I'll review it again. We've got to raise that and answer it. How did these animals get there? Because the liberals and the modernists and the skeptics want to make ridicule and mockery of us and really of God over this because they want to paint a picture of Noah, his wife, his three sons, their three wives, busy running all over Antarctica, and the Arctic, looking for these animals, trying to get them there to the ark. Well, what does it say? Verse 20. Of fowls after their kind, of cattle after their kind, of every creeping thing of the earth after his kind, two of every sort. You're going to have to go out and find them? No, they shall come to thee. Oh, yeah. Chapter 7, verse 9, chapter 7, verse 15. Three times, not once, three times. The Bible says that they had migration imparted to them and they were led supernaturally, not to get out of a cold area to find a warm area, or not to get out of a warm area to find a cooler area, but to go from an inhospitable area, which would soon be that because of the flood, to the safety and to the preservation of Noah's Ark. They would have been led there. Once they got on board, how is he going to take care of 50,000 vertebrate animals and 1 million different types of insects? Impossibility for eight people, even the most trained zoologist, to take care of that many critters or creatures. So, evidently, they had some other things imparted to them, hibernation, estivation, that type of quality, so that they could go to sleep and sleep six months and wake up and eat and drink then go back to sleep and sleep the rest of the more than a year until the flood was over i don't see any other way we're going to be able to get around these things besides staying uh, just with what the word of god says Amen. that these animals came unto them and if we're going to accept the biblical statements to be true that either two or seven of all species of every creature that lived under the whole of heaven on the whole face of the earth was to be preserved, then uh, we've got to get some miracles or something in here to help out. Now, God could have sent angels, I guess, and fed all the animals in their own stalls, but that's not said anywhere. It's not even implied anywhere. Why not take something that makes a lot more sense since we see that taking place today in a lot of animals? And remember, we've already discussed this earlier, but remember, um, 
hibernation is not just a characteristic of bears. And migration is not just a characteristic of certain animals. It's been studied by scientists and believed to be a latent possibility in practically all of the animal kingdom. It's just that some of them live in the type of area where they don't need to migrate. They don't need to estivate. They don't need to hibernate. But nonetheless, it's, it's latent within them. Even birds, like the whippoorwill, uh, has these characteristics within him, and according to some, they are utilized at certain times. All right, then we come now to a second general area, which is what we want to talk about mostly this evening, and that is post-diluvian faunal distribution. The first broad era was the physiological changes that we've seen as a result of the fall and as a result of the flood. Post-diluvian, faunal distribution. Big words, but I guess it's a big question, though. Now, this is really a two-fold question if you get the the pre-flood and the post-flood aspect in here concerning the distribution of animals. Of course, post-diluvian means after the flood. Uh, Ante or pre-diluvian would mean prior to the flood. And what this whole question answers and considers is the distribution of the animals. That's why I say it's really a two-fold question. You've got the distribution of the animals prior to the flood, how widespread were the animals, how widespread were all of the animals. We dealt in the whole message earlier, remember, with the question of how widespread was mankind. You see, we've got people who believe in a universal flood insofar as man's extent on the earth was universal. And since they believe it wasn't universal, then the flood was universal in that it destroyed all man. But all man only lived in Babylon, in Assyria, in that general region. Therefore, that's as far as the flood went because man wasn't outside of that. Where were the animals? Now, we discussed a long time on man. It's been proven that man was existing all over the face of the earth at that time. Where were the animals then? And then how did the animals get to the places in which we find them today subsequent to Noah's flood? I mean, you've got certain animals that live in certain places. And if the flood was universal, you see, it's no problem if we've got a local flood, no problem at all. The animals have always been in the same place where we find them today. <clears throat> but if the flood destroyed all animals everywhere, then we've got a problem. How do the animals not necessarily get back to the place from whence they came, but the place in which we find them today. Now, the first part of that question, again, we've answered before. The kangaroo didn't have to hop, skip, jump, and swim from Australia to get to the ark. He was probably living somewhere in that general area, as well as the rhinoceros, as well as the koala bear, as well as the grizzly bear, there's no hint in Scripture that God would have placed certain animals in a certain region. They would, they, the animals would have been widespread <coughs> everywhere. Remember, friends, the reason why we have animals in certain places today is because of the elements. That's what depends where animals live. Animals in the north can't live where it's hot. Animals where it's hot can't live where it's north. That's the whole... Uh, crux of the matter for us today the elements it's cold it's hot that depends on where the animals are going to live moisture and the dryness that depends where the animals are going to live there were not the extremes in the elements prior to the flood therefore you don't have to relegate certain animals to certain continents or to certain territories they would have been found fairly universal all over the place they would have all been together what I'm saying is that all of these animals prior to the flood that came on board Noah's Ark would not have had to travel for thousands and thousands of miles in coming from the other side of the globe. They would have been somewhere in that general area. Now, don't, don't someone raise the hypothetical question, well, how could the earth have supported, you know, think about all the animals that would have had to have lived in 
And I'll remind you of the name of it even today, the Fertile Crescent. And how much more fertile do you think it was back in those days? I mean, the name of it today is the Fertile Crescent because it's so fertile. Tigris, Euphrates, River Valley run through there. And it hooks right over, it loops across over into the Jordan River Valley, and then it goes right on down into Nile in Egypt, the Nile River. And of course, there's where you get your crescent, hooking from Babylon up through Assyria, over through Aram, down through Palestine, down into Egypt then. It's fertile today. How much more fertile prior to the collapse of the pre-flood water vapor canopy. Remember that had the greenhouse effect all over the earth. We're going to get into that in more detail next week, by the way, because that's one of the most fascinating things about the whole subject, as far as I'm concerned, of the flood, is the pre-flood water vapor canopy that was extended miles up into the atmosphere that produced the greenhouse semi-tropical effect from pole to pole and from the east to the west. Very interesting and very unique. It would be a blessing to have that today. <laughs> because we've got, you know, people, their bones start hurting when it get, gets too cold, so they move to Florida, and people like us that don't like to perspire move to Minnesota. <laughs> so... You got your extremes, and that's just that's in just within 1,000 miles. That doesn't count from the North Pole all the way down to the equator, which would be your greatest extreme, or from the equator all the way down to the South Pole. That's right here, not only on one continent, but in one country. We've got the extremes. It'd be a blessing to live. Time like that, it's not too hot. It's not too cold. It's just right. Oh, so we need a proof text for that, chapter 8 and verse 22. We've, we're, we're, we've got pockets filled with proof text for all these things. And common sense ought to tell you that anyway. But, uh, well, we'll say more about that next week. We've got proofs that are still with us today of the pre-flood water vapor canopy that was suspended in the atmosphere. Besides that, what are you going to do with Genesis 1, verses 6, 7, and 8? Day of creation, second day of creation. You've got a problem right there because the waters were divided. The waters above from the waters below. The heaven put in between them, waters below were then gathered together, and he called those seas and the dry land he called earth. What are you going to do with those waters above? <laughs> They're not clouds. Remember, there weren't any clouds here. <laughs> You're stuck somewhere. I don't know where, but you're stuck somewhere unless you just accept the biblical answer that you've got a pre-flood water vapor canopy that's supernaturally suspended up there. Remember, all the engineers on the earth could never lift that amount of water that high in the earth. So it was done by God's hand, supernaturally. Well, anyway, that's really the first part of the question. We've already looked at that. The animals didn't have to come from South America. They would have come from that particular region. But when we, from the Mesopotamian region, but when we get to the post-flood, the post-Diluvian era, we could say our day, we're post-Diluvian today. Now, we know very well certain animals live in certain places. So how did they get there? How can we explain this? Generally, there are three categories that people bring up in your face whenever you start talking about a universal flood. First category is known as the marsupial category. Most famous uh, animal in this category, of course, is a kangaroo. This means our pouched animals. The kangaroo is a marsupial. Well, have you seen any of those around lately? <laughs> don't live around here then, do they? Second category is known as our monotremes. Our monotremes are egg-laying mammals. You see, birds lay eggs, fish lay eggs, reptiles lay eggs, amphibians lay eggs, but it's rare when you can find uh, a warm-blooded mammal that lays eggs. I mean, people don't lay eggs. They give live birth, and so do most animals, or most mammals, I should say. 
but there are two exceptions, and they're known as the monotremes, the spiny anteater and the duckbill platypus. Well, where do they live? You see any of those around here lately? <laughs> you can search in all of Minnesota's lakes, and you'll never find a duck-billed platypus. Uh, he caught the wrong plane if you ever find one there. <laughs> a third category is known as our edentates, E-D-E-N, Eden, in other words, T-A-T-E-S. And these are toothless, or nearly toothless, slow-moving animals. Most famous example here is the South American sloth. That's where you get your good old King James word slothfulness. You're full of sloth characteristics, in other words. A sloth, he doesn't like to do much. He hangs upside down by big curved uh, uh, projections that he has on his four feet and he just hangs there most of the time when he decides to move then he'll move a little bit and then he stops again so if you ever wonder where you get your name a slothful individual it's because you act too much like a sloth some people pronounce it sloth but I think the correct pronunciation is sloth but that's neither here nor there now these are found in South America. They're not found in Mesopotamia. Kangaroos aren't found in Mesopotamia. Duckbilled platypus is not found in Mesopotamia. The spiny anteater is not found in Mesopotamia. Now these are the three general categories that people will raise in front of you right away when you talk about believing. I mean to be so naive as to believe in a universal flood because this is what people really think about. But it's really true of all animals. You don't see many uh, mockingbirds, so you don't see any mockingbirds here in this state. But that's a state bird of Mississippi, and it's a state bird of Tennessee, and Arkansas, and Texas, and Florida. You don't see that many cardinals like you see if you get a little further south. The cardinal is a state bird of a lot of states. Uh, Illinois, I believe Indiana, that general region there, Ohio, Kentucky. North Carolina, Virginia, West Virginia. But we don't see a whole lot of loony birds down south, though. That's your state bird, if you don't know it. Here is the common loon, the loony bird. We've got loony birds down south, but not, <laughs> not common loons. <laughs> but see, this is really true with all types of animals. They are found indigenous, you know, in a certain area. So... It's really no big problem if they want to say, what about the kangaroo? You can say, what about the common loon? You don't find the common loon in Australia. It's true of all animals. Mm -hmm. And our question is, post-diluvian faunal distribution. How'd they get there? Well, let's look at some attempts to explain or to answer this question. I've got several to give you. First of all, the local flood theory here the local flood advocates claim that where we find the animals today is simply where they were created. You see, obviously, they really don't have the problem that we have if you don't believe in a universal flood because no kangaroos were needed on board the ark because the ark, because the flood didn't destroy Australia. So therefore, you don't have any problem of the uh, post-diluvian distribution of the animal kingdom scattered over various continents and in various countries because this is simply where they were created, Genesis 1, at the time of creation, if they even believe in you know, a literal creation, which of course most of them don't. But assuming that they do, this is their view. Because, you see, all that would have been taken on board, whenever it says that it was a universal flood, then what that means is universal as far as Noah can see. You know, from his point of view, you know, he looks as far as he can see, that's, that's universal, that's all over the globe. And therefore, all you would need would be animals from that general area. You'd need a cow, or you'd need a serpent here, because we see a serpent, and you'd need whatever other animals that uh, Adam and Eve would have been acquainted with right there in the garden or that Noah would have been acquainted with there in that general Mesopotamian region. You get to the Americas, the mockingbird, you don't need any mockingbirds there because mockingbirds don't live in Iran or Iraq today. 
and all the other creatures that you can find all over the whole globe. You can find mammals, birds, reptiles, amphibians, <coughs> insects, remember, were included, creeping things, that means in King James insects. So all these things would not have been included because they would not have been found in that general area. And if the flood was only local, then it would have not reached beyond the proximity of the Mesopotamian uh, region. Well, only problem with that is the flood wasn't local. So that doesn't answer anything, you see. If the flood was local, we've got our answer right away. The flood never destroyed Australia, so he didn't need any kangaroos. He didn't need a representative, in other words, in order to ensure the posterity of that particular species because they, in fact, were not destroyed during the time of the Great Deluge. Another answer to this question, which is just as fanciful, but it's held by those who do believe in a universal flood, is that the animals were simply recreated after the flood in their present-day indigenous regions. So the flood was universal. It wiped all the kangaroos out down in Australia. But after the flood, God just recreated new kangaroos down there. For the continued is that the animals were simply recreated after the flood in their present day indigenous regions. So the flood was universal. It wiped all the kangaroos out down in Australia. But after the flood, God just recreated new kangaroos down there. Well, we've got several problems with that. First of all, nowhere is that even hinted at anywhere in the Genesis account. And secondly, it's a little ridiculous that Noah would have actually been required to take all these animals on board when God was going to recreate them afterwards anyway. So I trust you see how that logic falls through real quickly. He wasted a lot of time and energy on all these thousands of animals. Remember, they believe in a universal flood, which means he had to have representatives of every animal everywhere on the globe. Now, if that's true, you see, it would be better to believe in the local flood and believe in this view. It wouldn't help that view either, though. But for those that believe in the universal view, you're making a mockery of the whole uh, sixth chapter and the first half of the seventh chapter of Genesis, second half of chapter six and first half of chapter seven, with Noah spending all that time getting all those animals on board, I remember, I think, the last couple of verses of chapter 6, uh, verse 21. Take thou unto thee of all food that is eaten, and thou shalt gather it to thee, and it shall be for food for thee and for them. Well, my word. He's wasting time, because God's going to recreate these animals right where we find them today afterwards. So why go to the toil and the trouble? of providing for and feeding the animals if God's simply going to bypass all of your pious labor that you've done according to his will. Thus did Noah, according to all that God commanded him, so did he. If in the long run he's going to backdoor it on you and recreate these animals in these places anyway. That answer doesn't solve the problem. A third answer comes from our evolutionist comrades. They explain that over the process of millions and millions of years, the animals migrated to their contemporary locations. Now, I give this as the evolutionary view because if they had a view, this is what they'd hold, that it took millions of years for the animals to get here. But guess what? Evolutionists don't believe in a, 
local flood or universal flood. They don't believe anything about the Bible. So they're not even concerned about answering this question. But what would still come into play is the fact that wherever that lightning bolt eons ago struck that amoeba in that great swamp and started the process of life, and that eventually evolved into mockingbirds and gorillas, then how did those animals get where we find them today? Well, this would be their answer. So it'd still be answering the same question of post-Diluvian fallen distribution. They just wouldn't have to put it after the flood because they don't believe in a flood. But how did these animals get where we find them today? I mean, I guess you could say that if you were believing in the evolutionist view that um, lightning struck in several different places, but they don't really believe that. And if you're a Christian and you believe in the universal, the biblical universal flood view, not theory, then you've got to come to grips with the question of how and when and where and why, and by what means did the animals get to the places where we find them today. You think about this. Remember we said before that back here in Genesis 1, God created certain kinds and said that regardless of whether it was conscious or unconscious or self-conscious life, all three forms were to reproduce, whether sexually or asexually, after themselves, after their kind, and begin to propagate their race and thereby fill up the earth with all the various species. But in the beginning, we don't have to assume that there were as many different sweet peas over 500 as we have today, or as many dogs everywhere from the little Dasset Hound or the little Dachshund all the way up to the St. Bernard, you know, the Great Dane, the Russian Wolfhound. We don't have to assume that there was this many varieties of dogs or he's going to have to have a collie, a black lab, and all these other types of dogs on board the ark with him. How many different types of dogs? We have no idea. We know there were dogs. There was a male and a female dog. Whether there were four different kinds of dogs, we don't know. I would say it's safe to assume there's probably only one kind. There was a dog, and a dog was a dog. And a cat was a cat. I'm talking about your domestic type cat. And a lion was a lion, and a tiger was a tiger. Sure, they're all in a cat family, but a tiger and your little cat that you have at home are entirely different from each other. Maybe they've got claws and fangs, but one weighs several hundred pounds more than the other does. And one eats about that much more also. So... Um, what I'm saying is, back here at the very beginning, we don't have to have all these, uh, these different kinds that we see with us today. Now, how we got the kinds, we'll get into at a later time. Well, we need to go on. Another theory or another view to answer the question, how did the animals get in the places in which we find them today, is uh, the view of some of the early church fathers that the angels transported the animals supernaturally after the landing of the ark on Ararat. Of course, it would have been snowing up on top, rarefied atmosphere. So, <laughs> you would have had to have gotten the animals out rather quickly. So, you know, Michael, Gabriel, and all the hosts of heaven would have descended like flies upon the ark, <laughs> grabbed those great dames by the neck, the kangaroos and duckbill platypus, and taking them to the places in which we find them today. Okay. Now, you laugh at some of these answers, mm -hmm. but you have any better one than some of these? I mean, that angel one, that solves it quickly. Yeah. You don't even need a proof text for that. <laughs> <laughs> that's the problem with all false ones. You don't need a proof text. You just believe it because that's what you said or what someone else said. Same with all these other ones. You don't need a proof text. <laughs> thing is, uh, just by means of logic, these things don't stand up. Well, we're left, thankfully, with the biblical answer. Oh. That is, we believe over the process, not of several million years, but not even several thousands of years, but several centuries, 
that the animals migrated to their present places and those that needed such would have migrated by means of land bridges. Now one argument against this is the following. If this is true, if the biblical answer is that the kangaroo got to Australia over a period of several centuries by migration, by means of land bridges, and that means that at one time, notably before and immediately after the flood, he would have lived in Mesopotamia. And if it took several centuries and you're going to have reproduction taking place of the male and the female kangaroos and little baby kangaroos born, and not all of them would have just taken off on a trail and headed for Australia. Some of them would have died there. Then the question is raised, why aren't there any fossils? of animals like that found in that particular territory. And I've got an answer to that because, well really to answer that we can raise another question. And I'll have to give you several texts for this, but look over to begin with in uh, the book of Judges, chapter 14 and verse 5. Another text is 1 Samuel 17, 34. Uh, that's talking about David and some of his exploits that he did. 2 Samuel 23, 20 talks about some of the feats of the mighty men of David. Uh, 1 Kings 13, 24. That's about the false prophet and the true prophet, and then we'll probably look at 2 Kings 17.25. If this is true, after the flood, we're going to find all these animals right there in Mesopotamia. And it would take several centuries for them to begin to progress and leave that general area and territory to get to the destination where they were destined to be then why aren't there fossils of a duck-billed platypus and a spiny anteater? Some type of remains of an animal like that, somewhere in that area. Well, to answer that question, we can raise another question. And this is from the Old Testament. It is stated in all of these passages here, uh, we'll look at these two, Judges 14 and verse 5, that there was a particular animal living in Palestine at, at a particular time. Then went Samson down and his father and his mother to Timnath and came to the vineyards of Timnath and behold a young lion roared against him. And just for completeness sake, 2 Kings 17.25. This, I believe, is the text of the plurality. This is very interesting. After the fall of Israel, you remember... The fall of Samaria, 722 B.C. And you've got the incorporation of heathen people into the midst of the poor and weak and lame and blind Israelites that had not been taken by the Assyrian truculent overlords. And as a result, they begin to propagate the Samaritan race and begin to worship false gods. And so on the basis of this, we have 2 Kings 17.25. And so it was at the beginning of their dwelling there that they feared not the Lord, these people that have been brought from other regions, you see, to repopulate the land. Therefore the Lord sent lions among them which slew some of them. Well, it's been noted by one of the most famous archaeologists today, the one who has done extensive work. He's a Jew, by the way, at the Hebrew University in Palestine in Jerusalem, that there has never been found any type of a remain of a lion in Palestine. Of course, there are no lions there today. There's never been a fossil found. There's never been a bone found. There's never been anything found whatsoever of a lion, and the Bible tells us specifically that just several thousand years ago, I mean, this is way after the flood, 
And if, if all the, the remains of the lions in Palestine have disintegrated, then how much more all the remains of the kangaroos in Mesopotamia? Because there wouldn't have been any fossil remains of them there. There wouldn't be any bones left. All of that would have disintegrated. And if this is true of lions in Palestine, several thousand years on the other side, on this side, as a matter of fact, of the flood, then how much more is that going to be true of all these other alleged discrepancies of animals where we find them living in other places, but no remains of their forefathers coming off the ark and living somewhere in Mesopotamia or in Turkey? or in southwestern USSR, or somewhere in that general region. No remains of lions ever found, but the Bible explicitly tells us that lions lived here in the Old Testament. The best example is the first one we gave you. Everyone remembers the Samson story about the lions. Lions, lions like in Africa, lived in Palestine. And you won't find any lions there, except maybe in a zoo, but they don't live there anymore. They're gone from that area. They've been killed out. They live basically, of course, down in Africa right now. No remains, though, have been found. That's the key here. No remains have been found. And Palestine is not uh, a very large region. I mean, it's just 100 miles by 50 miles. That's not very far at all. You can pretty much excavate looking for the remains of lion bones fairly quickly in a very short period of time over a region like that. I mean, a much shorter period of time than looking all over Turkey and southwestern USSR and Lebanon and Syria and Jordan and Iran and Iraq and uh, West Pakistan and all the other countries that would be in that general area. That's a lot of territory. Now, before the archaeologists can say that there are no kangaroo remains there, have you looked under every stone, first of all? Because there's always a possibility that it's under that last stone, that one under which you failed to look, that you're going to find that bone of that kangaroo. Now, I'm not saying that there are any. I'm saying just the contrary. There aren't any because there aren't any remains of lions there in Palestine anymore. So this really gives us no problem at all. Now, I want to show you by means of of this transparency what it would have looked like these uh, land bridges that I'm talking about here. Now, as you see here on this map, you need to turn it on sideways, uh, the other way. There you go. Now, here we've got all of our continents of the world. Here's where we're going to end up with the the ark landing right here in this general area and notice that almost without exception even today we're not talking about back then yet we're talking about today all of the continents are connected the one with the other by means of some type of land bridge there are a couple of exceptions today and they're very small exceptions though it's not like the kangaroos got to swim from here all the way up here or really i should say from up here all the way down here to get to australia where we find him today but he would have gone by means of land bridges now this is northeastern ussr siberia here in the northern region this is the arctic circle here this little region that separates the ussr of course this is the globe here it's flattened out but separates it from the Aleutian Islands and uh, western Alaska is known as the Bering Straits and that is very shallow water and it is very very narrow channel right there and it's believed by most people today that at one time there was a land bridge that connected the USSR with Alaska now they weren't known as the USSR in Alaska but would have connected this continent Asia with that continent North America and what I'm saying is all right How does that mockingbird get over there? Or let's take an animal that's going to crawl. How does the American gray squirrel or the American fox squirrel, which is a red squirrel, which we find here in this country, get from right here? Remember, after the flood, none of them live in North America anymore. No animals live there. It's been completely destroyed. All animals, all flesh has died. How is that American gray squirrel, that American red fox squirrel, going to get 
from right here all the way over there. He's not going to swim across the Atlantic Ocean. He'd freeze to death. Well, there, we've only got one choice here. Now, if you've got a better one, tell me, but you don't, so don't make a fool of yourself. <laughs> you got the ark landing right here, and here's what the gray squirrel would have done. He would have gone right up here. He would have crossed right across here into Alaska, come right down through Canada, right down into the old U.S. of A. Now, that's why we say it took several centuries for this to happen. He didn't think, hey, Minnesota would be a good place to live. <laughs> We're going to head in that territory. We're going to head in that area. It would have taken, you know, several centuries for this to have resulted. And it's all under the providential control of God. Because they would have had, we hadn't gotten into this yet, but of course with the change in climate, certain animals can only live in certain climates, and he would have directed those animals to get to the right climate where they would survive. Now, of course, some didn't make it. That's where the problem of extinction enters in. But um, most of them have made it. I mean, there are more animals that did not become extinct as compared to those that did become extinct. Now, the same is true with all these other things. You say, well, what about Australia? Well, have you ever recognized this whole Indonesian island chain that connects Southeast Asia almost with Australia? And it's also believed that at one time these islands, are, you see there are islands that are submerged here that are just underneath the surface of the water, would have been above the water, and therefore you've got a land bridge connection over which Mr. and Mrs. Kangaroo would have hopped in going from Southeast Asia down to Australia. No problem at all. How is that slow-moving sloth? He would have probably taken several million years. <laughs> How is he going to get from here? Well, remember, he lives in South America. So only choice he's got is the same way the great squirrel went. He's going to come up here, Alaska, Canada, North America, Central America, down here to Brazil in South America. Now, that's why you have to think about these things, and that's why you have to study these things, because you've got to come up with answers on how did certain animals get in certain places. But you see, it's really not any problem. Now, for those that fly, they could have just flown there. They wouldn't have to have a land bridge, obviously. But for those that would be walking rather than the flying transportation, they're going to have to have some type of land bridge to get there. Now, the same thing is true with Greenland, but Greenland's nothing but snow and ice, not much lived there anyway, so that's not a big problem. But they, again, would have gone across this territory to Alaska. Do all of you know that this is really a round? I mean, we live, okay. Yeah. You know that this connects, okay. I don't want to lose anyone back in third grade geography here. <laughs> they would have gone across from Siberia, over here to Alaska, through northern Canada, and on up there to the barren, desolate island of Greenland. Now you say, what about, uh, like, say this island right here, Madagascar, is a famous island because a lot of very strange creatures live only on Madagascar. Well, the same thing could have happened. I'm talking about uh, animals that don't fly now. They could have come down from this area, they would have crossed through the Suez Strait here, come down here through Africa, and they either could have crossed on a land bridge that existed then, but that doesn't exist today, or that's not that far of a swim. They could have gotten a ride with a porpoise or something like that. <laughs> and over there. They could have swam themselves. but. The point is, they could have had a land bridge to go across on at that time. Because, you see, we're constantly having uh, changes of things right now. You see, people say, well, how did the Indians ever get here? They got here the same way. They came right up here. They crossed right through here. They came through uh, Alaska, right on down here to the plains. And that's how the, the Sioux and the Cheyenne and the Blackfoot and the Navajo and the Cherokee and all the rest of them got to North America or got to the United States. They say, now how could Noah look like a Cherokee and a Navajo and all of them at the same time? Well, I thought you might ask, but don't because we haven't gotten to that yet. But what we're studying now is their transportation and their distribution. This is the same, the same thing now is true with man. 
Not only could he have gotten on a boat and sailed. I mean, remember, they built the ark. Man was pretty smart. He would have no problem building a boat. People like to hail Leif Erikson, first really, you know, boat that ever traveled, that came over to Greenland and Nova Scotia. Well, they could have had, and they did have, much greater boats than that many hundreds of years prior to that time. And they could easily have gotten on in what is today Spain, or really Portugal, is this western part of Spain, and sailed from Portugal right on over to Nova Scotia or over to Maine or something like that and sailed. They did it in 1492, so why couldn't they do it in 1492 B.C. rather than A.D. 1492? Well, really no problem with the post-Diluvian distribution of the animals. Now, do you have any questions on that before we go on? What happened to the land bridges? <coughs> local flood, well, we've had terrific typhoons and cyclones and things like that at sea. And we've had volcanoes since then. The great volcano that started just several decades ago in Mexico has caused a whole new mountain there. And uh, the same is true with a lot of these islands. An island can spring up overnight and be an island, a volcano, and disappear in a huge storm. Just take the top of it right off. So remember, we're not talking about five years ago. We're talking about thousands of years ago where you can have these tremendous changes take place in these land bridges. The Bering Strait, we've only got two exceptions, the Bering Strait and Indonesian Islands. And remember, those aren't problems at all because the Bering Strait is shallow water and it's a narrow channel. And the Indonesian Islands almost connect the one with the other. And there are some underneath the surface of the water. Okay, if we've got time, let's go on to one One more thing, and that concerns the new relationship that animals had to, with man. Now, we've gone past post-Diluvian distribution. The new relationship, this is another effect of the flood. Remember, according to Genesis 1, 26, 28, and 2, 19, man in the very beginning was given dominion over the animals. He had dominion over all the animals. This is proven not only by these texts, but by the fact that whenever the serpent came up and started talking to Eve, she wasn't shocked or afraid or anything. She had authority over that serpent. She had dominion over that serpent. She was not afraid. You see that Jesus has dominion over the animals, like the fish and the wild beast over in the Gospels. Man lost that dominion as a result of the fall, and therefore the violence of Genesis 6 verses 11 through 13 probably refers to the violence not only among the animals between one animal and another animal but between animals and mankind himself we've read these verses before God said to Noah the end of all flesh has come before me for the earth is filled with violence through them behold I will destroy them with the earth now you say well there's no mention of animals attacking man here is that what he's talking about? Most definitely that's what he's talking about. Or why, after the flood, does God need to put a special fear in the animals of man? You see, something would have had to have been taking place prior to the flood. Namely, animals would have been attacking and destroying and eating men. And it's not until after the flood that we have, you see, he's lost his dominion. He didn't regain that. Ever since Genesis 3, he lost his dominion over the animal kingdom. We, it's still lost to us today. Isaiah 11 says it will be restored during the time of the millennium. But the new relationship is seen in chapter 9 and verse 2. The fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth. Now why does he have to say this unless the animals have been attacking man? It's a new provision that God is making on behalf of mankind to keep him alive and safe and upon every fowl of the air upon all that moveth upon the earth and upon all the fishes of the sea into your hand are they delivered now this primarily has to do with your larger animals fear said so i am going to place a special type of fear of you in all of creation in all of animals 
that's seen by the fact, look what most animals do. You just don't have birds in the wild come and just light on your shoulder. They're afraid of you. Now, by constant training, you can train them. I mean, sometimes your neighborhood squirrels, it can take a long time to train them not to be afraid of you. But what God has placed that there for is primarily for the protection of man. Can you imagine what it would be like, dear friends? I mean, this is an awesome thought that most Christians don't think of. If this special provision after the flood had not been made, it, made, if this fear had not been placed in animals, that's where people like Mr. Hitchcock has gotten his movies, like The Birds. Have you ever seen that? That's a horrible show. Or The Bees. Or about a decade ago, a very popular movie known as Willard. Do you remember that? About the rats. You see, that's a reversal of Genesis 9-2, a perversion of Genesis 9-2 that people like Hitchcock and the writer and the author of Willard about the rat have introduced. Can you imagine what it would be like if birds had no fear of us? They could just come and peck us to pieces, which is what happens in that film. Same thing is true with bees. Now, you bother with them and they'll bother with you. God placed that in them to protect them. But he has made them in such a way after the flood, not before, but after, so that for the most part, they're afraid of mankind. And it's good that they are. If they weren't, we're in for a lot of trouble. We're back to Genesis 6, verses 11 and 13. God's going to destroy the earth again for violence because animals are attacking men. You see, that would be the same uh, circumstances under which we'd find ourselves today if this had not been a result of the fall. That's why we call it a final effect or result of the flood. I mean the flood, not the fall. The fear of you, the dread of you, shall be upon every beast of the earth, every fowl of the air, upon all that moveth upon the earth, and upon all the fishes of the sea. 